Hey, hey, Mike, what's the connection between white linked mangabies, coconuts, and malaria? I know this. I know the answer. Mm. Know. It's Matt Rendell. Hey, good guess, Mike. Shall we, uh, shall we have him on again? Yeah, why not? Let's get him in. Brilliant. Hi, I'm Mike Brampton. And my name is Julian Ho. Welcome to Veterinary Ramblings. Welcome back to the show, Matt. Thank you. Thanks for coming on again. Thanks for suffering a second time. You're very welcome. Is that a picture of penguins you've got on your wall there? It is, yeah. That's lovely. It's, a, it's an eclectic mix of my girlfriend is a penguin keeper, and then below it is a pigeon um, racing thing from my granddad, who was an expert pigeon racer. All right. Uh, 1928. Be honest, did he ever win? I bet the pigeons did every time. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't do a lot, I don't think, other than breed them I don't, and let them go at the right time. But, but that's, <laughs> that's a different era, I think. They always circle round once. Do they? they 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 fly out and circle around once. Is it clockwise or something before they can set off? Pick up on a bit of um, magnetic um, north, and then they're off. Yeah. yeah, I reckon they're thinking. There's a Crystal Palace tower. Right, I'm off. Yeah. Mm. Could could be, yeah. I Probably. think there's other theories about them wanting to go home and look after their fledglings, but yeah. Quite probably, right. Mm. Come on then, team. Let's, on let's, team. let's get into this, shall we? Right, so can you can you share details of that project with us? Yeah, so um, for uh, it's for Wildlife Vets International, looking at uh, there's a population of white nape manga bees um, in Ghana that... Um, they, they still get kept as pets and, and turn up as babies and, and fairly random. And they have um, a group of manga bees in a, in a, in a forest enclosure in, a, in the back of a zoo called Kamasi Zoo. Uh, right. Kamasi Zoo is like a small kind of city zoo, but they have a really nice enclosure completely tucked away where they have a group of about a dozen manga bees. And the project is to try and screen these manga bees to... Um, a level that would be comfortable to put them back into the world which would be amazing um and it's a project i've been working on for about four years right um, two of those extra because of covid and um mm. i went back out about six months ago and met with the head of the forestry commission and um all of the big um kind of stakeholders and i've got really good support from them now so hopefully a bit of kind of uh, additional kind of research to do but hopefully we're hoping to do the health screening um, later this year with a view to releasing them back into the world. We've got a place for them to go and um, yeah, everything's kind of fallen into place other than COVID slowed it up a little bit. So so you're, you're going to go back later on yeah. this year, are you? Right. Yeah, I've got to go back. Um, yeah, it was an odd situation. When I was out there six months ago, I got asked about sea turtles as well. Did I know anything about sea turtles? And right. um, I'm working on a sea turtle project as well. And so they have a problem with um, sea turtles getting washed up on the beach, one area of beach, um, cause unknown really. So they, and they just find them dead, and and the numbers are quite significant. Mm. Uh, they're finding about three or four different species. So how yeah, how, so how often does this happen then? Uh, it's seasonal, um, but they they you know they they're saying that at certain times of the year they can get thirty or forty turtles washed up dead a month. But mature so, adult. Oh, Adults, yeah, yeah, and some of them are leatherbacks as well, and um, and leatherbacks are not considered as endangered as others, but they're a seriously slow-growing animal. Mm. So yeah, so I think so. I'm hoping to do when I go back out there later in the year, hoping to look at those as well. Which is, again, it's one of those challenges that you don't expect to get involved in um, as a veterinary nurse, um, and also some of the challenges within it are quite bizarre so obviously we're going to try and post-mortem these turtles on the beach and there's no electricity at all so I'm scoping out uh, angle grinders and blades suitable to cut open sea turtles which is not a lot of literature on there's not a lot of anecdotal stuff that people are publishing about the best you know do you buy a dwarf or a you know whatever um, angle grinder to open the shells of turtles so yeah mm. it's going to be a, going to be an interesting one so uh, is this being sponsored by Screwfix or uh, tool station <laughs> <laughs> um and there's there's some from really a DIY like, point of view I go for DeWalt there's but some really the um life is great some really concerning bits amongst it so they're they're not 
checking these turtles to be 100% sure they're dead. Um, and we know we see drownings in sea turtles where they look dead, uh, but actually they are, mm. you can resuscitate them. So um, so we're buying some very nice pen dopplers to try and work out exactly mm. what's going on with them before we decide what we do with them. Before you start um, cutting them open, yeah. Because yeah. we we know from experience that intubating them and ventilating them, you can often bring them back. It often takes a couple of hours, but you you can do it. So Right. So, wow. Yeah, so quite bizarre, really. Getting back to these white name manga bits, you said they're being screened. Yeah. For what are they being screened? Um, so, for TB? For, so they would be screened for TB, malaria, um, some of the more serious pathogens that we are pretty certain aren't out there. So Sleeman insufficiency virus and um, just the things that would be terrifying to release into the world. We have mm. a really good situation that we have a, well, it's a really good situation, but it's occurred in a bad way. So there is an area there. Um, in Ghana, where we know there was manga bees, but there are, it, there isn't any more. Um, so, from the point of view, we know why they they became um, not in that area, and those risks have been mitigated now. So, that's a really good place to release a family unit. So, the plan is to release a a group that is a family, you know, with a very well established male and a good matriarchal female, and then, um, yeah, hopefully in time they'll build up the numbers and then create a corridor into another group of wild manga bees. Okay, so so what was the reason then? So there's, there's been um, lots lots of work done about the holistic kind of one health approach to these things. And um, one health is a funny thing, as I'm sure you guys know, it kind of, it, it's become so sexy now, it kind of covers everything and people are using it as a way for um, getting certain types of funding. But what was happening was is that they didn't, um, the, the, people living in those areas didn't have a living um, and they would grow coconuts and sell the coconut oil to kind of rich businesses and they get and they were getting really really ripped off so one of the things that WAPCA did was went in and set them up so that the they could do the coconut oil in an organic way so right. they produced organic coconut oil that and were able to sell it to direct to companies uh, so I think it increased their profit by about 150 percent overnight wow. um, and as part of them getting that support um, and it's ongoing support as well they 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 agreed that they would become it's, it's hard to describe what they do but they're kind of ambassadors for the manga bees and mm. they even have certain members of the of those areas that are become kind of sheriffs for the areas and they're allowed a certain remit. So they're allowed to take guns off of people if they find them in the woods and they think they're hunting for um, manga bees. Um, and up to a point, they're allowed to take their money off the people as well. And nobody really cares where that money or the guns go either. So that's quite a nice um, benefit for them. And then they can go on and sell the guns or use them for, you know, hunting species that is permitted. And, yeah. and it's created a really good, positive vibe about uh, the manga bees themselves because they've, this funding has only come because of the plan to hopefully put the manga bees back out there. And that's just to make a change, isn't it? That's induced. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the key thing is that um, there's been so many times where we've got it wrong, where we um, Europeans and Americans go into a country and, and decide what, what that country wants without actually engaging with the people. And, and just to make it clear, WAPCA are the people that decide if we put these manga bees back in the wild we, what wvi's role is to get them to a point they can and then they have to do all that hard um kind of assessment and putting the things in place for post-release um surveying and making sure that they go okay back in the wild so because this mm. will be an ongoing project these monkeys these manga bees turn up all the time um so there'll be more to replace these ones in the forest enclosure which is a natural enclosure um, and they've planted natural, naturally occurring plants in the enclosure as well. So the primates learn to forage the right things and what to eat. And so yeah, it's it's very very sound. So yeah. so let's not beat around the bush here. They were in effect the manga bees were wiped out of this area because of human animal conflict. Yeah, and for loss of habitat. So and there's always this thing everywhere I've ever worked where you get what's considered conflict animals. There's always a you know, a, a, um, a persecution against those individuals. And, it, it, and it's understandable because often the people don't have a lot 
and if they come and there's a you know a tiger eating their goats or there's a um a manga bee still in their crops um then you can understand them being really angry and and <laughs> seeing that that is a, a bad thing and um the the translocation of of conflict animals is really really interesting and basically doesn't work um so i think often they the they, the people are at their wits end and decide that the only thing to do is to start take taking on the primates and starting to to remove them from that area which is a, is a shame um but you can see how it would get to that point you know it's, sure. it's understandable sure. absolutely i remember i remember how i changed my attitude towards foxes overnight um when the fox killed all my chickens yeah um and that was you know it, it took me quite a long time to sort of get the balance back in my mind that uh, well, the fox has got a right as well, and he's hungry, and there they are. Yeah, and I, and, and I like the way that um, we 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 now start to challenge those things properly. I think the days of just you know just assuming that what we do is right, I think is gone. I think we always question everything now, which is yeah, mm -hmm. is sure. makes us down science. So imposing our will just isn't the right way, is it? Uh, there's got to be a a more holistic change yeah. to it. We have lots of challenges as well because I think the whole um, the whole kind of perspective of captive animals I think is changing and I think as time goes on it will continue to change. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it makes for an interesting landscape for sure. Sure. And talking of landscape, are the are the coconut plantations there? Uh, is, are they doing a monoculture of it? Is it is it all coconut palms? Is that part of the problem? Yeah, people have yeah, people have looked into that because again. Um, like oil palm it, it it it's seen as the bad guy and and you know it has to be removed and um the the challenge there is that it it definitely alters biodiversity because it alters the environment the the the, the challenge is is that the most of the people in those countries are not necessarily getting the money from those plantations themselves and that's yes. where WAPTA have been really good so lots of the uh oil palm plantations that I've seen in Indonesia and in um in Ghana um are owned by the Chinese government and 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 so they're they're kind of investing in it as well which brings brings roads and and infrastructure to the to the area but it does knock the biodiversity and ultimately not necessarily in a positive way for the the people that live in that area it's often mm -hmm. not not particularly beneficial today and i think that's why wapka have really um really hit the nail on the head because they've created a really positive environment that's good for everybody the government are really really behind it the meeting hybrid government they were super keen to be involved and um and really happy to provide whatever we needed so yeah so it's it's all very positive it's just there's a there's a huge with, with these things there's a huge responsibility of making sure we've done done due diligence and we're completely comfortable with it and obviously there's lots of pathogens that we we don't really fully understand in primates so it's there's a lot of work to be done within that and which you know i'm chatting to different experts in the field to get their opinions of what's what really so yeah a lot an interesting project but a long-term one so over the next five years you you mentioned something earlier on there matt which which really intrigued me and is something that i've not really given much brain space or thought to um you mentioned malaria yeah and you were saying that testing for malaria in the mangabees yeah so there's always been there's always been a theory that um primates could be a reservoir for malaria right um, but as far as i know it's never been proved especially in west africa it's never been proved mm -hmm. right um, and these certainly the ones we're working with didn't show any signs of having um malaria at all so they they took they've, they've actually been screened for it previously because um there was a kind of health concern for the people looking after them and uh, where they are um where they're held there's a, a fairly dubious river in inverted commas that runs about their enclosure that um has a few west african crocodiles in it but also probably has plenty of um mosquito larvae in it so there was a concern that that could be a game changer for that enclosure because the plan is to build another enclosure next to it um right. when i say enclosure it's hard to describe this enclosure it's like the size of a football pitch and it's completely 
uh, overgrown, we would call it in an enclosure. You can't see them in it. They have the choice to come in and out when they want, and they've got a, um, a, a nice secure area if they want to come in, but they can stay out there if they want. And um, it's completely naturally planted and everything. So it's, it's super good. Um, mm -hmm. But there's always the concern that they, you know, if they were a reservoir for um, malaria, that would have implications from a One Health point of view of putting them back near a, um, a human sure. settlement, basically. There have there have actually been. I think it was I think it was Malaysia. Um, there were two or three cases of malaria mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in in humans that were traced back to a type of monkey in Malaysia. I can't yeah. remember which one, but um, yeah. so there there have been. I think it was published in Nature a couple of years back. Then. Right. So, I know that there's been quite a lot of implications of. Um, like with TB, most primates that catch TB catch it off of people. Um, mm. So it's, it's probably, yeah. Absolutely. Which, which way is it travelled? Uh, yes, people on this travels there and back, isn't it? Interesting. Yeah, it has to be on your risk list, basically. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. What, what do you do about malaria then, Matt? Uh, I, it depends on where you are in West Africa. So I tend to just take malarone. I'm never out there for long enough that I couldn't take anti-malarials and, and they're cheap now and nothing would spoil the project quicker than me getting malaria or getting sick while I was out there um mm. I was, I'm very cautious when I travel I don't take chances so I, I yeah I would just take yeah be boring and take malarone I think if you're out there for long enough people stop taking it but I think yeah for the, the periods of time I'm there it's just not worth the risk so so do you carry a mosquito net with you uh no I just stay in a really nice hotel <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, I, 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 I say that as a joke, but um, the hotel I stayed in last time I was in Kamasi was owned by a Canadian lady who was Ghanaian but now lives in Canada. And it was a beautiful hotel and was very cheap. So um, there was definitely no mosquitoes there. I, I, have, pictures, I have pictures of you in an A-frame tent. I, I, I think people tell you those things, but I don't think there's many people. It's a, It would be a difficult decision, you know. Five dollars, ten dollars, you can stay in a nice hotel, or two or three dollars, you can sit in a tent and get bitten by mosquitoes. It's. Do you, I, I go to the nice hotel as well. I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you on that one. And the, and the breakfast yeah. in the morning, and yeah, clean towels. Why, why, why not? So it's very Absolutely. reasonable. No, no mosquitoes, and, big boys breakfast, ten quid. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm there. And and also uh, mm. another thing that's the kind of thing that we never talk about is that. You need you need to rest. You know, if you're working in these places uh, uh, from working in India, if you I've stayed in very cheap hotels in India and you can't rest and you don't eat properly and you don't look after yourself and you get dehydrated and then you just don't perform. You know, you mm. I can I can work in India where I can be doing procedures with the vet for 12, 14 hours a day. But then knowing that I can go back to the hotel, have a shower in a clean bed get up in the morning have some breakfast feel completely refreshed and come back whereas if you're if you're not getting rested i think that's when you get sick as well i think you you know mm -hmm. you have to accept that you get yeah you get run down mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i want to i want to travel back in time to to the to the young matt rendell at 11 years old running around the, the new school the new I was never sitting running around. Let's not go mad. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> sitting down at his desk in a new school, thinking, yeah. what, I'd, what I'd really like to do in 20, 30 years' time is decide whether I want to lash out three quid more a night and stay in a proper hotel with good boys' breakfast and no mosquitoes. What, what led you on that journey? How did you get to where you are now? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. And it, when you look back on it, it is a bit strange. So... I was um, I was quite badly bullied at school, so I got beaten up and had all of my stuff stolen quite a lot. So when I was in about the third or fourth year, um, I found my own solution for this. I, I didn't go. So um, I, I went to a quite a decent school and you could turn up, put your hand up, be registered and then leave and nobody would really kind of spot it. So, yeah, we used to, I used to go and then and then just leave and just go and hang out. And um i used to go to reptile shops and fish shops and just yeah just mooch about and then go home and i had a really good teacher and really interesting i've spoken to him fairly recently a guy called uh, mick swift who was a pe teacher and i've always been fairly happy that all pe teachers were intrinsically evil but yeah um, i go along with that 
he was actually a really really good guy and um he could see that i was going off the rails so he took me to one side and we had a kind of cup of tea in a very weird way like your school teacher never makes your cup of tea do they i've ne not heard of these things so um and he decided that he <laughs> I, knew I used to have to go and buy fags for my teacher yeah, I think PE teachers again. That's in their CV that they all have to smoke, isn't it? They have to have a yeah, tash yeah. and a and right, smoke. Yeah. Um, Go on. But he he decided that um, he could see that I was going to get in trouble, and he he just said to me, "I want to help you. Why don't you just find something you actually might want to do as a job, and then we'll release you from school one day a week." So he decided, which looking back was a bit maverick, that he would allow me as a I was about 15 at the time. He would allow me to just not go to school one day a week and find something that I like to do for that day. And, wow. and looking back, um, what a cool I think guy. he probably was the, was the person that set me on the path. So um, my, I decided uh, I'd kept reptiles since I was 10. So I had snakes and lizards and things since I was 10. Um, and my dad at the time, um, bless him, he, he, he knew a local vet, so he said, oh, why don't you go and see what the vets is like? You know, they, they, I know they do reptiles. And so as a 15-year-old kid who was very anxious and and had him, having been bullied, I, I went and got a place to go one day a week into this practice. And to start with, it was terrifying. They made me wear a shirt and tie, and I had to kind of watch and, and kind of observe. And then I'd never heard of veterinary nursing. So, and then I saw the veterinary nurses and just was just blown away by how good they were. You know, they just did amazing stuff and, and um, yeah, it was really, yeah, just, mm. just thought they were incredible. They, they just did such cool things and I just wanted to do it. So that I then had to then kind of um, pull my socks up and go back and do a couple more GCSEs. Cause I, I'd kind of not bothered with them. I'd kind of put them to the back of my mind. So I went back in mm. and did a bit of time in sixth form as well as still doing one day a week for them. Um, and I kind of became like a, what we would call a veterinary care assistant. Now I kind of got, did a bit of everything, but they liked me because I wasn't frightened of snakes or lizards or anything really. And I was really lucky that I passed my exams and then they offered me a student nurse job. So I went straight from school, straight into being a student nurse. Um, and then, yeah, some of this stuff is quite deep, but my mum and dad were incredibly supportive for me at the time because they didn't have a lot of money and the stuff was tight and they they basically went without to to allow me to go and take that job so right. they, they got me like mini cabs backwards and forwards on the days they couldn't take me and and i never found any of this out until you know many many years later um and i went on and qualified there and then stayed there for about 13 years so and went through all the different kind of roles within a veterinary practice and then ended up as the theatre nurse. I've always liked kind of anesthesia of things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was, it was super, super cool. And about 10 years after I was at that practice, my dad gave me in a frame, my first ever wage slip. So he'd kept that for 10 years and put oh, it in a little fantastic. frame. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Super cool. So yeah, so that so it wasn't, it wasn't kind of planned and, and, mm. I can remember going back after about two weeks of being in practice and speaking to my careers teacher at the time, and they hadn't heard of veterinary nursing either. And they 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 said to me, and, and this is as true as I sit here, they said, oh, for a boy working with animals, either on a farm or in a slaughterhouse, that's kind of, that's your kind of two areas that you could work at and earn money and, and be successful at. So yeah, that's, that's kind of terrifying. Um, and then, yeah, it went all full circle. So I'm actually going back to speak to the school kidleys at the school I went to um, sometime in July. So I'm going to go back and have a chat to them, which... Fantastic! ...now become a school of sporting excellence. I think they waited until <laughs> I'd left a long while before they did that. But, <laughs> um, there were no chance while Matt said it. Wait till he goes. Exactly, yeah, wait, wait till he disappears. But yeah, and so I was, is, I was is really your, lucky. Is your sports teacher still there? Yeah, so he's part-time now. He was, he was head of it. Um, he was like head... Thing. he was my year head and my form tutor as well and and um but he's now now part-time so but yeah i'm hoping to catch up with him at the same time so it'd be so nice to see him so what, emotional. what got you in touch with each other again after all these years uh, um i i won an award so um i won a bsava award for um being a veterinary nurse and i just thought it was a really nice thing to say thank you to well well deserved i must say matt Fantastic. Well deserved. 
Yeah. So congratulations. Yeah, and that. he was he was really pleased. So it'd be nice. Yes, so I never I've not seen him in person since. So you reached out to him. Yeah, I said I've tracked him down. Either to be sad, I sound, sound like I'm being Columbo. Tracked him down. He was still working at the same school. So <laughs> it's, it's like, they're, they're hardly cryptic school teachers, are they? So um, oh, really, it, it was a matter of just contacting the school and asking if he still worked there. And they they yeah. were happy to facilitate me just letting him know. And I gave Let's, him a copy of the. Award tell us card. about this conversation then. So so this was triggered by which award at the BSOVA? Um, I wrote run the. Bruce Vizas uh, Jones Award for Veterinary Nursing right. in 2020. Congratulations. So, thank you. Um, yeah, well done. So, um, yeah, so I thought it was just nice to say thank you. I, I think being a school teacher is incredibly hard. I was horrible. And um, I think to, to show the dedication that he did and to, to ignore the fact that I was an absolute pain in the arse and focus on the fact that he could see that I was, you know, passionate about things was yeah amazing so how did this conversation go which one well the, you, you've tracked your, your old school teacher down yeah and, and you i can imagine you because you you're very you're very humble in all of your achievement and I, I can imagine you going hello sir do you remember me almost thinking that he wouldn't remember you yeah, I, he was very polite. So I, I sent him an email just saying, oh, I, all I wanted to do was say thank you to him. I'm going to get all emotional now, but it, it was just, yeah, game changer. So. I think it's fantastic. It's, it's great, really. I think the part of what makes a brilliant teacher is seeing that spark in a kid. Absolutely. Yeah. And igniting it. And, uh, do you know, I, I was um, a bit emotional as well. I joined you there on, on this map because uh, about two months ago, I got sent uh, a message on on LinkedIn right. from uh, from a, an old school teacher, an English English teacher of mine, um, who you know back in back in the day when I was at school, uh, gave me a role in um, in one of the school plays, and I'd always been into drama, but uh, he really fired my my dramatic my thesp nature on that, and uh, you know every every now and then since leaving school, I thought, well, what? What happened to, to Russell? What was he up to these days? And and I tried. He left school, so it was a bit more of a detective work. He left that school and gone somewhere else. And I could not figure out how to get hold of him. And um, I thought, well, you know, there's no, no point in trying because I, I never will. And I was I was quite touched. He actually found me on LinkedIn and contacted me. And it was it was so nice getting back in touch. And so I can I can empathise with your your uh, emotions there it's that um yeah. I, I don't know it's a combination of nostalgia and the 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 feeling that actually you're reconnecting with someone who did give a shit back in the days yeah and, it, and i think you know everyone always thinks that they had it worse when they were at school but it was you know it was a big school big classes hence i was able to sneak out without anybody noticing mm. it was you know it was reasonably like rough and ready so it was yeah, he took the time to do it. And I think it, yeah, I don't know what would have happened without him. I don't think I would have stayed on the straight and narrow, probably, to be honest, because he, he just gave me an outlet for something that I knew, well, I didn't know I wanted to do, but I just knew I was, you know, I was interested and passionate about animals. So I just knew that I wanted to do something related to animals. So, so yeah, a combination of, of him and my dad, basically, and my mum. I, I think we have to thank him as well, because we wouldn't have had you on Absolutely. our last show twice as a guest of it. Wasn't him, so anyway. well, I was going to say, we'll, I'd, we'll I'd, I'd, to him later. I'd, I'd say thank you to them as well because without them, you and I wouldn't have met. And yeah. we've had some, we've had some interesting little scrapes and and, and mini yeah. adventures. Although you're yet to take me to Ghana, and I, yeah. I, I quite like the idea of going and staying in a five star hotel in Ghana now. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a Ghanaian five star hotel, but but yeah, no, it's it's definitely <laughs> definitely nice. But yeah, I think it, I think. Those people have a really, really hard job, and I think mm. it's nice to just, re as you say, just reconnect and just realise that they do make a massive difference and under very, very hard circumstances. So, that's, yeah, yeah they, that's they really fantastic. Do. They really that's do. fantastic. So, you're going to share this with them in in June, did you say? Your, oh, yeah. Your... So, I, uh, July. Sorry. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Um, I'm going to go back there, and hopefully, he'll be there. But um, they want me to write a little bit for their like students and stuff, and just go and say hello to them. So. We'll see. They'll probably think I'm a complete weirdo and not understand it either. But but 
it would be nice to try and put a little bit back and yeah they probably kind of... will i wonder if any of them will um will actually appreciate just what a i'm gonna, I'm gonna probably embarrass you now but what what a what a very talented and incredible veterinary nurse you, you are because it's not immediately obvious you are as mike said you're self-deprecating yeah and you're going to downplay what you do but actually you uh you were recognized with the bruce Vivash award for for doing uh something pretty amazing to the veteran profession and moving moving it forward so um i wonder if they will appreciate that because yeah. we, we've spoken to a lot of incredibly special yeah. people on the show. Yeah. Everyone we speak to has their own story. Everyone we speak to is incredible in their own way. And, and there are a few people who, who really stand out uh, in, in the profession itself yeah. as, as being, uh, I don't know, living history, whatever. But, but you're one of them. So, Matt, th- thank you for that. And thank you for doing it. Not, uh, that's, that's enough. I'm not going to... I'm not going to boost your ego any more tonight. We're going to obviously rip the crap out of you for the rest of the evening, but um, just, just take <laughs> that. As, as, that, would, as, that would be much easier for me to deal with, I, to be I honest. Would. I could certainly I'm much get better with people being that. nasty so we'll, to me than being nice to me. So yeah, I could you're much more used to it with Mike and myself. Yeah. So <laughs> I wouldn't want it to be any other way. <laughs> no, <absolutely. laughs> uh, but when um, I, I went back to my school once, uh, this was a few years back, they wanted me to talk about being a vet. And um, and the first thing I said was, um, you see that plaque up on the wall? Because I, I won a, an award, a dumb prize for Berlin. I said, look, that's my name there. And as soon as I said that, I thought, shit, now they know I'm an arrogant tosser. They've completely <laughs> lost any empathy with me. And I, I lost interest in what I was saying because I thought, no, they're not interested in it. And they weren't. I, was, <laughs> I lost it. So, yeah. Don't, don't go back and, and no, I, th- I think I think it's nice and I think I, I'd like to think that there's there's some young girl or, or boy in the audience that's sort of wondering what they're gonna do and you get that chance to spark that fire in them as well yeah. and that would be yeah. really yeah. nice I think that's the best thing about I think it's the best thing I ever get to do really is so I still have students now in my practice and they just they just make me laugh and smile all the time because they're just hilarious. So yeah. I have a student called Chloe who um, she was a bit lost in her kind of portfolio and her training and was getting a bit disillusioned. That names have been changed to protect the innocent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, mate. we'll call we'll and, call um, this girl Chloe then. Yeah, carry on. The first time I I met her, we had a an egg bound duck in uh, that had got a very oversized duck egg stuck. And um, the vet brought it in and just said, oh, can you just put this on a on IV fluids and give it some calcium and x-ray it for me? And the first thing she said to me, having never met her, was you can't put a duck on a drip. She was like, you can't put a duck on a drip. Don't be ridiculous. And I was like, well, <laughs> just, man, you can stand and watch me because I'm going to do it. And she was like, oh. So since then, we've had quite a fun kind of student relationship. So it, it, I think that's the, the the best thing you can do is just you know get, leave a legacy and hopefully do your bit. So mm. and yeah, students are the yeah the funniest thing I think. So they they're great and remind me why I still do it. So sure. Yeah. Look, last time we spoke, we, we chatted about um, diseases of exotics. You, you said that the majority of the problems with the exotics were, were due to poor husbandry. Is, is that yeah. still the case? Do you think it's been a couple of years now? Things yeah, changed. Sadly, sadly, yeah. No, I think it is still the same. It's it's. Um, a really good thing that nurses do is to educate people on their animals and it, it maybe anim, maybe people are getting a little bit more receptive to um to take to clients taking information but i think as the professions we have to balance our approach to it um i always talk about the velvet mallet because essentially you can if you have someone come in with that's I, i've had a client recently come in that had bought two um blue gold macaws because she'd seen them and she'd bought two captive reared hand reared blue gold macaws see mm-hmm. and they're, they're incredibly beautiful like no, no amazing. Doubt. Amazing, we yeah. started off with her talking about the cage she was going to keep them in and then we kind of progressed through for me to saying well actually probably an aviary or a room would be better and i think sometimes as the veterinary professions we can be very quick to kind of snap at people and say you've made a really stupid decision and those people have done it 
it, they often haven't done it out of malice. They've done it because they just don't know that they don't know. Um, oh. And if you can encourage them and support them while kind of telling them that they've made a terrible mistake, I think is is a, is the only way to approach it. Because I think what happens otherwise is they just don't come to the vets. They just decide that we're all against them and then they don't come in. And we see this, see this a lot. And um, it's frustrating because th those people are genuinely, they're sponges. They're looking for sound advice mm. and they want you to support them. And I think we're, as the veterinary professions, we can be a quick, bit quick to jump on them because they've you know they've, they've made a bad decision so right. um i think the velvet mallet is 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 a good way of looking at it so essentially i do tell them that they've made a bad decision i do tell them that these parents are going to destroy everything that they love um but while at the same time not pushing them away just explaining that these are the things they're going to need to do because otherwise they they either feel embarrassed so they rehome them and then they never get looked after then they go in that cycle of rehoming or they just don't ever come for advice so they go to the internet so which is a, yeah is is a risk i think you're absolutely right we, we 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 do a great injustice to to the to our pets the animals under our care by alienating the owners yeah yeah and I think, you know yeah. we, we may completely disagree with their reasons for getting them however yeah. they've got them and it's up to us then to say well okay let's try and improve their lot yeah, yeah. To, to, to just just tonight my my wife told me about her cousin in um in cyprus with a canary uh and she said it's a, it's a cage bird is on the kitchen table and it's plucking its feathers what what should uh, what should i do i said well what you should do is go back five years and not buy it um, yeah. <laughs> that's not the answer really is it no no what you but, you can, is, but you can yeah you can say things those joking i say those to clients all the time so clients oh, yeah. often say to me what would this corn snake like and i often say north america because yes. essentially <laughs> that's where it would like to be but it but but it isn't in north america it's in brentwood so you, you know you have to kind of adjust it and try and it, it, encourage them to look after it properly and you get it in a bigger enclosure and play breaking bad out. to it and that that helps. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's yeah a big big area we need to improve on for sure. So, so what's hap what's happened with these two birds? Do you think so far? Um, the people um, she sent me pictures of the enclosure, and um, I put her in touch with. I gave her the details of the World Parrot Trust, so she's looked at enrichment, and she wanted the breeder had told her to have their wings clipped to help with training. We don't ever wing clip now. It's just like absolute mutilation. And and also, should they wanted their nails clipped? And and so anyway, a long conversation went by, and I explained that these are super intelligent birds, and she's she started training them now. So she's she's in actually getting more out of training them than I think she is actually of owning them, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. just yeah. Them that she can um, do their nails already, and they come to her now, and they'll come to her hand, and so they're they're they're, they're, they're she will enjoy them more than perhaps you would have done which is important because those things bond they get used to one pla one place one kind of setup and mm. if they end up getting sold and moved on their their, their welfare will be compromised right? so you've enriched all their lives yeah well it's that thing about making a difference that's that's, that's all otherwise there's no point is there if you don't make a difference then what's the point might as well no. kind of just stop because um as you said it's it's quick to judge these people but actually you know you need to try and help them as best you can and um sometimes that could be hard if they catch you at the wrong time or if they say the wrong thing or you know mm. the classic rabbit conversation of oh you know he was only 10 pounds so we thought he'd be cheap to look after and and yeah. you know you're kind of saying from well, actually no rabbits are not great pets for kids and that, that's kind of yeah this was this was a bad decision but you are, you are where you are. You have to kind of you know, deal mm. with those things. So. I think sometimes as vets and, and, and uh, nurses, we forget that the um, very fact that they bought the pet into the practice in the first place means they want to do something for them. Yeah. They care. And we just think, no, they've, they've got no idea. No idea. Yeah. And, we, and we resent them for that. But they want an idea. You're right. They're sponges. I think you said mm, yeah. they want to learn. They want to understand how to make this this animal that they bought for whatever reason. Yeah. But but actually, part of the reason is they love it or they want to love it. Yeah. But they want and, to know how best to love it. One of the things I say to parrot people when they get new parrots is 
when you share things on social media, share the bad stuff and the good stuff. So, you know, share that the parrot is great to own and it's lovely and they've got it sitting on their shoulder and that's lovely, but also share the fact that it's ripped all the cables out the back of the TV and, you know, broken their skybox yeah. and, and destroyed all the cables and, you know. And, and, and eaten their ear loop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, chewed their ear off or eaten a diamond ring or something, you know. So <laughs> it's important that you share the, the love of both sides of those things. So and, and crapped down the back of their Gucci suit. Yeah, 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 generally. <laughs> so I think, yeah, it's just making people, again, just realistic about what it is to own that animal. So. Mm. I'm I'm just wondering how ten year old Matt Rendell's husbandry was with his reptiles. Uh, I think um, looking back, absolutely terrible. But it was a very it was a very different time. So we were mm. there was nothing was captive bred. Everything was wild caught. Um, we didn't really know the information that we had. There was no internet. It was all about books. And my dad used to take me every week to buy books. So we used to go to a second hand bookshop and just wrote oh. about finding books on reptiles and things. But there was nothing. Um, so we had to kind of guess. So and also the equipment we had was terrible. So there was nothing, nothing was built for reptiles. There was no definitely no UV light. There was no thermostats. There was no heat mats that worked properly. Um, so it was all a bit um, risky. Um, mm. And despite all that, I did OK. <laughs> so I used to breed a few things and, and enjoy owning them. And, you know, I had some of the snakes. I had I had one snake for 30 years. So, wow. Um, so, yeah, Could, so couldn't mean too bad. In those days, you're right, husbandry was awful, but we didn't yeah. know what we didn't know. Yeah, and I think that's true of this era now as well. There will be mm. things that we're, you know, I'm I'm getting a bit obsessed by UV in mammals. So we, we're seeing a few house rabbits now that have got low D3. Um, and, you know, it's not, there's not a pattern to them. There's not loads of them, but something is going on there. So, you know, we, we need to start thinking about all of these animals that mammals that we keep without, exposure to sunlight is is a, mm. a massive thing and what it does to their well-being as well as their you know the, the 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 kind of physiological side of it but also their mental well-being is probably quite significant so, it, it is yeah. i saw um, i saw an article a little while back i can't remember where it was but it was entitled something like do, do animals get sad yeah right and you know i'm sure they must get some sort of yeah problem mental health problem not having access to sunlight yeah, I think it's fascinating when you start to look at species that have lived in incredibly hot, incredibly enriched environments for years, and then they get brought into captivity over generations. You know, these things yes. are not necessarily well caught, but you do wonder what effect it has on them generally, you know, just on them as as individuals. And I've been extremely lucky to have hands on captive tigers and a couple of wild tigers. And the wild ones, obviously under anaesthetic, make that clear. I'm not wrestling with them. Um, they, <laughs> the wild ones are so much more muscular and and just fit for purpose. They are super, super strong and super lean and just incredibly powerful because they're you know they're living their life in the wild with yeah. huge amounts of UV and and yeah a very a very different regime. So it, do, it does yeah. make you wonder about the whole kind of ethos behind it and the ethics behind it. it it's everything isn't it you know, do you pay more for wild caught sea bass or farm sea bass yeah there's yeah, that's the question yeah. Uh, gosh yeah I, I, and i won't i won't go too far down that route because i love eating fish but i, I sort of turn a blind eye to uh to yeah. husband group and you know terrible i think it's fascinating now we're getting um that crustaceans are now it's been agreed that they have yeah. um, you know, sentient. sentient beings. That yeah. Is, is, yeah. You know, and, and again, it, in that short period of time, I was reading some of the stuff around that, and um, they were saying that, oh, now we're not going to be able to shrink wrap live lobsters. And, and you kind of think, was that okay? Did, did we do that for years and <laughs> think that that's okay? I yeah. didn't even know they did that. You have to laugh about it because you can see how that became the norm very quickly I right, the yeah. lobster will just shrink wrap it in a bag live so that it stays fresh till it gets to its place of um yeah of, of being eaten so yeah and i think yeah. if yeah. that happens in such a short period of time we have to reflect on yeah in a decade's time what what are we going to look back on and be you know, embarrassed about uh, be absolutely horrified about yeah. yeah there was a whole there was a whole mythology wasn't there that didn't unless you unless you boiled them live they there's somehow the meat would spoil or they they'd uh, they'd be sort of poisonous almost yeah uh, yeah yep. and i i was I, i've been to several um 
fish cooking courses mm -hmm. along the years. And you, you told it that, uh, yeah, quite categorically, the way to kill them humanely is uh, with, with the lobster to stick a skewer you know, right between the, the eyes and push it forward yeah. 45 degrees because that gets the neural net. I said, well, that does it though? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. How are you sure you got it? Oh, you can always get it. It's always there. Have a go. No, you yeah. missed it. What the absolute? You know, oh, no, 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 no. The next course, no, no. The best thing to do is to put it into boiling water. Boiling water is great because it kills them instantly. Yeah. Does it really? No, no, you put them into cold water and then bring them up to the boil because they don't notice the change and they you know, get cosy in the warm water. We don't know. It's a short answer. No, we, we just, just don't, don't know because we don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I was at the Shed Aquarium a few years ago and they, they've put a lot of research money behind just understanding the how lobsters live, basically, and how they grow. Mm -hmm. And they had some there that were absolutely enormous and they were saying, they've no idea how old they are. They've grown since they've been there and they've continued to grow and show signs of being reproductive active, but they've actually got no idea how old they are. And I know there's been loads of work about trying to establish how, how long they can live for, but again, it's a it's a known unknown. So, yeah. um, and there's lots of conservation efforts now. People are farming them properly and and kind of fast starting them, so they release them at a, a stage where they know they'll survive for longer. Uh, they'll survive mm -hmm. more will survive and things. So yeah yeah but again it's just yeah how things will change over the next yeah period of time in our lifetime oh, this is it and we've got to just keep our minds open and learn haven't we yeah yeah and yeah. uh you know, we've we've everything. learned quite a lot tonight i mean speaking of learning matt it's been a long time since you've been on the show do you, yes. do you remember the section called 60 second cpd so I'm just going to do random facts for you just to that's fantastic that's all i need that's absolutely like, fine I so like random facts matt randall Super nurse, yeah. 60 seconds on white naped mangabees. Okay, so mangabees are a medium-sized primate from West Africa. They are considered endangered. Um, they're, they have pouches in their mouths, and in captivity, they often stash things in their pouches. Uh, so it's, it's not unusual to anesthetize them and find coins in their pouches uh, because they put them there and they like them to feel against their teeth. Um, they're very, very smart. They're very easy to train. They can be box trained and be trained to be hand injected. And they, they live in very big groups. So, and there's loads of evidence that in wild groups, they have granny and step granny and lots of people that help rear the babies. So mum herself doesn't do a huge amount of the rearing. Uh, the others look after them as well. Um, they And yeah, that hopefully we can anaesthetize a few and get them to a stage that they can go back in the wild. They're incredibly charismatic. Um, and yeah, they're, they're a little bit of an underdog because people don't know what they are, so. Wow. I'm amazed. I, that was completely off the cuff. That was 60 seconds. They, um, I, thank you, my favorite, that was brilliant. That was my favorite Mangabee story is working in the zoo when there was a, um, a couple from um, London turned up and we're looking at the manga bees and one of the joys of working in a zoo is listening to parents lying to their children um, because they don't understand what the animals are and I can remember a couple walking to their walking along with their child and trying to explain to them what a manga bee was and they said to their child I don't know what sort of bee it is but it's not your ordinary bee it's a manga bee <laughs> <laughs> and then going on to say that the mesh was quite big, so it must be quite a big bee, because obviously it wouldn't be able to get through the mesh. So <laughs> I think I think adults lying to their children is just gold. And I think manga bees have that thing that they nobody really knows what they are. And I think as conservation, from a conservation point of view, if we can predict those things and get ahead of the curve, then yeah, then happy, happy days. So I, I like the idea that they save money to pay for the doctors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, still, they're still mobile phones as well. They do. They're very, they're very, 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 very clever. Um, I've seen one escape in Ghana from an enclosure when it had just arrived, just by outsmarting the keeper, and just you know, just you could, you you can't feel you can't feel anything but pride in how incredibly clever it was. So it just decided to do a bit of a wobble and then fall over. 
and then wait for the keeper to run in. And then as soon as he went to get help, not shutting the door properly, it just opened the door and walks out into the jungle. So really, and, so, yeah, that's fantastic. So they're, yeah, they're su they're super clever, and they they you know they're they're probably um, hatching plans like that over many days. You know, they're not, they're not <laughs> sure, kind of thing sure they are. So. The thing that always gets me about Mangabees is um, it's such a big name, and it's you look at them, the 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 they're not tiny, they're not as tiny as Mama's X or anything like that, but yeah. they have such small faces, don't they? they look yeah, like the boy the boys are quite formidable. They they can be a handful and they mm. they uh, they they continue to grow for quite a while. You know, they 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 can be quite aggressive, but they 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 they're good looker outs for the group. They basically defend mm. that group to you know to their death basically. Um and they yeah, they're they're not they're not massive, but you you I wouldn't want to mess with a, an adult male certainly. Um, they they, they amazing they, teeth, yeah. aren't they? Amazing teeth, yeah, for no yeah. apparent reason. Um, <laughs> so um, they you know something that eats fruit and and leaves probably doesn't really need those huge teeth, but no, you see them yawn and then in the zoos they these huge great fangs. Holy crap, they're big. They, uh, they yawn as a dominance thing, so they, they, you know, it's a normal primate thing to, you know, I'll just, I'll just make sure you all know I've got these enormous teeth, so I'll, I'll just do a little smile, um, just so that you can just see it, and that's that's a good way of just telling the group, you know, okay, you know, I'm, I'm here if you need me, kind of thing. So this is a sort of man spreading thing, isn't it? No, 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 no. It's nothing to do with that. I, I know what this is. They do this right. big yawn so you can see how much money they've got in their cheeks. The coins, yeah. I'm the big egg round here. Drinks are on me later. I've got all the money. You yawn, your loads of money. Yeah. Somewhere I've got I've got a two pence piece somewhere that came out of a mangabee's pouch, and it was it was perfectly shiny and smooth where it had been in there for so long, probably ruining its teeth. Um against its pouch and we had one yeah. in Ghana recently that got a nut stuck in her pouch only a baby and mm. um she must have snatched the nut thinking I've, I've I've won the lottery and then stuffed it in her pouch and then couldn't get it back out again so she she had a fairly significant um obstruction so they had to just give her a quick anesthetic yeah. and pop it back out for her but wow. so yeah, not, so, and, and is it as, as a pouch goes is it the normal sort of pouch an extension of the usation tube or, yeah, pr pretty much. They're they're not as big as some species. So um, the langurs in India, they, their yeah. pouches are bigger, and they 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 work they work much better as a team. So the the adults will send the babies in to steal food off of people, and then stuff it in their pouches, and then the parents just kind of hook it out of their mouths when they come back and and eat it. So it's, they're, they're but, pouches from, are bigger. Probably say, "What have you got for me, Dodger, my boy?" Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also, no, nobody um, is clever because nobody really wants to be unpleasant to a baby monkey, whereas a giant 15, 16 kilo langer is a, you know, you wouldn't feel so mm. bad having to wrestle with it to try and save your samosas. But if it was a, a baby, you'd be quite happy to, you know, you just send other stuff into it. So. Amazing that they know that, isn't it? Yeah. They just but, don't want to risk it. I think that they, um, they know that. The, 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 yeah, that the babies are safe. And and don't get me wrong, I've seen it where uh, a tourist tried to hold one of the babies. So the baby was stealing rice and the tourist kind of went to hold her and then looked over her shoulder and there is the 15 kilo male showing his teeth and just kind of saying, that's my kid. You better let that go. Otherwise, um, we're, we're going to have a fight. And um, again, I was on the periphery of the outskirts of that. I wouldn't have wanted to be involved in that. That would have been... Um, very brief and very terrifying for the person because he would have just uh, yeah gone to town. So. Did the tourist get the message? Uh, she was terrified, but she because she was so frightened, she didn't let go of the baby. So because I think it's that it, you know intrinsic thing that she was so frightened she didn't know what to do. And and yes. my my friend there, um, Soham, who's a really good biologist, Indian biologist, he was saying to her, just drop it, just drop the you know saying it, just drop it, and then walk yeah. away, and everything will be okay again. But because she was so frightened, then uh, she didn't do it. And then you know that the langurs are are naughty in India. You know they they punch mm. the street dogs for just fun. You know they will swing out of trees and crack a street just street dog on the head just because it's fun, and the street dog can't get them. And so they have a they have a naughty nature about them which makes me like them a little bit more but um they they do get conflicts you know they do get in places where they shouldn't be and cause sure. trouble so. amazing well i have a certificate 
for uh, right. for your for your CPD for today and your your general uh, information you've given us tonight. Um, it's a slightly different certificate because I was, I was thinking we need to have something to to register the fact that you've been on twice. Uh, so it's not a veterinary ramblings certificate tonight. It's a certificate of veterinary rendlings. Right. Okay, that's very so, good. Uh, Thanks. So there we go, and, we, and we've got uh, we've got a few things now. The one thing I didn't put on here was uh, was a mangabe, so I'm sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, but we have got what have we got? We've got a uh, we've got a horned viper there. Yeah, uh, uh, I, don't we'll, think that is a, I don't mean that is a horned viper, but we'll, we'll let it, it go. Yes, yeah, it's not. It's, it's, I think that's uh, a matagornis. I think that's a rhino viper, but we're, I'm fine with that. We'll just gloss over it. We'll just I, I, is, is it, is get it, it in the edit. That's yeah, um, yeah. that's. Bitus gabonica, that's a gaboon viper. A gaboon, ah, that's, it's, it yeah. is a gaboon. It's the COVID again. So well done, Matt. Well done. And we've also got a rabbit with really nasty teeth. I see that. That's definitely a rabbit. I'm, I'm that's, comfortable that's with definitely, that. That's definitely, that's a rabbit. It's comfortable got with. teeth, so it must be a rabbit, yeah. Come on. Now, I, I believe that's a toque gecko, but I'm not sure. Actually, it's not, is it? It's not a toque no. at all. No. No, what it's, is it's that? like it's a sal sumo. It's a day gecko. Probably it's a, a day gecko. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and that one was having ectisis problems. It was having a keep it up, shift. Matt. This is awesome. It's good, yeah. uh, there, there's there's a there's a newly hatched turtle. Good, good, yep. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a chuff blaming another chuff. I do like them. Jersey have got those chuffs. Nice. Like that. Yeah. Um, that, 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 those chuffs were on the uh, on the balcony of a place I was staying when I was skiing a few years back. Nice. Um, and, and there, there, and there's a giraffe's bum. Bottom. And no. now, the thing about this giraffe's bum is, I was looking at it, and I was thinking, that's an overweight giraffe, isn't it? Look at that. It's it's hard to be very sure on a picture, but it does look like it's on the the chubbier side of things. That but... that is that is a fat giraffe. Never got never got over that. But anyway, you're absolutely right. It is a gaboon viper. Um, and. Uh, I think it's my COVID. I'm completely unable to recognise any animal at all. But it's a certificate of veterinary rambling or veterinary rendlings. And it certifies right. that our guest was so awesome. We've had him on twice, and that doesn't happen often. So That's very kind of you, Matt, Matt Reynolds. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. So so much for being on tonight. For joining us again, for uh, interesting us with your with your life, for educating us. With your mangabeers and your general joie de vie. Uh, Absolutely fabulous. And thank you for educating and inspiring the future vets and nurses of this world. Uh, Matt Randall, may your Thanks. dog go with you. Yeah. Good luck uh, to you both. May your dog go with you, Matt. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>